make a start. Firstly, as is customary ahead of ARDC webinars, we firstly pause to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and we pay our respect to elders past, present and emerging. Welcome everyone to today's webinar on Metasat. A reminder that today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the ARDC YouTube channel. Backed by the John G. Walbach Library at the Harvard University Center for Astrophysics and in partnership with the Libra Space Foundation, Metasat provides a vocabulary to describe satellite missions and a set of implementation tools. And as one part of an international engagement, governance and community development strategy, Metasat wishes to explore opportunities for community engagement within Australia. Today, we're very fortunate to have Dana and Daniel to discuss Metasat. Dana is head librarian at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and Daniel is Research Fellow and Metasat Curator, also based at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. With that, I'll pass over to Daniel to share his screen. We'll have presentation and discussion and there'll be uh, time for people to ask questions and make comments later on. Thanks and over to you, Daniel and Dana. Okay, everyone I'm assuming can still hear me all right. Um, so, okay, I see some nods. So, thank you for humoring uh, the uh, confirmation. Um, I'm really glad to have the opportunity to speak to you all uh, this evening here uh, and a good morning slash early afternoon to all of you over in Australia. Um, I think that uh, it was really exciting to get uh, I guess the suggestion to have this webinar, uh, because one of the things like Rowan uh, alluded to that we're trying to do right now is focus on uh, Metasat's international applications and to um, think really concretely about where we go from here and to make sure we're grounding everything we do with an international perspective. And so focusing in on Australia made sense for a couple of reasons. And so um, we'll get to that in a minute, but just Thank you again for having us. And I guess without further ado, uh, next slide, Daniel. Um, so I guess a little background. So Rowan gave a short introduction to who we are, but I thought that it would be good for uh, us to make it a little more clear where we're coming from and why we're working on this. So who are we? Uh, we're librarians. Um, librarians from in training and in Daniel's context, he's working mostly as a research uh, fellow on this specific project, but he's also a librarian. And we're coming from the Center for Astrophysics, which is a collaboration between Harvard and the Smithsonian, where uh, we serve a community of scholars and scientists and engineers who undertakes both space-based and ground-based astrophysical research. So uh, because we're part of both Harvard and part of the Smithsonian, it's not always clear to some people that what we're talking about is not a purely academic community. About three quarters of the people that our library serves, uh, just locally anyway, are actually um, staff scientists who work on uh, missions funded externally, primarily by NASA, um, but it's not uh, a purely academic uh, context. So it's good to make that clear. So next slide, please. And I guess to make this even more abundantly clear, what is it? Uh, what is the CFA? So we are, like I said, a collaboration between Harvard University and the Smithsonian. We're based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And uh, the group that we're talking about locally is actually one of the largest um, gatherings of astronomers on the planet. And our library actually is one of the largest astrophysics research libraries in the world. So. Uh, we really are trying to cater to our local community, which is itself pretty diverse and large, but also uh, due to the nature of where we are and the kinds of collections that we house and the services we provide, we're actually talking about trying to serve the whole astronomy community. So when I say the community that we serve, I'm trying to ta think more globally about uh, all of the researchers who could be undertaking this kind of work. Um, and part of our mission, so I've made a big part of our mission, um, being to both anticipate and respond to um, challenges that in, 
impact that community. So that broad community, that global community of researchers, academics, engineers, um, what can we do as a library to try to give them the resources they need to do their work? And a big part of doing that is facilitating communication and collaboration. So um, all of astronomy research, just about, is international in scope. Um, one of the things that's wonderful about astronomy but adds complexity is that everyone needs to share. So people share time on telescopes, people share data sets. Um, this isn't a world where you get to redo observations. So um, facilitating communication and collaboration is a big part of making sure we're supporting the community. Um, so next slide, please. And one of the ways that we do that is with metadata. So uh, Daniel's gonna talk uh, quite a bit more about what we're talking about specifically with Metasat and with metadata. But uh, generally, you're all, I'm sure, somewhat aware of what we're getting at here with metadata. But to sort of, I guess, uh, distill it down in its essence, metadata is a consistent and precise way to describe things. And because our community uh, is working on space missions, the things we're describing are all aspects of the mission itself. So, um, yeah, let's go on to the next slide. Um, and a, a mission has many aspects. So there's first the things that, that the astronomers are studying. So what is the actual focus of the research? Um, and then there's the way in which they do the research. Um, and we have built tools in collaboration with our community, so working with the community, to support their information needs for one for the prior uh, side of the coin. So when it comes to actually describing astronomy as a field, um, Katie Fry, who's on the call, is actually the curator of another uh, project we have called the Unified Astronomy Thesaurus. So this is a um, unified thesaurus that integrates uh, kind of older disparate resources that were used to describe the field. And we uh, have had this, uh, had this vocabulary, this controlled vocabulary be implemented by the American Astronomical Society among others. And uh, it's currently hosted by the ARDC, thank you. And uh, like I said, it's curated by Katie. But this was um, our first aspect of supporting the community's information sharing needs was to develop out this thesaurus that really describes the astronomy itself. Um, so uh, next slide. And uh, but what about describing other aspects of the missions? So if we weren't to be describing uh, the science itself, there's many, many, many other aspects uh, to a mission that need to be described so that we can actually uh, work with each other so we can collaborate so people can communicate and so that they can work together internationally so this is where metasat comes in this is that other side of the coin so this is a project that i think we're really pulling a lot and building on what we've learned from the uat because it has been so successful um, so next slide please uh, I thought it would be useful before we get into what Metaset is and how we've structured it and what we're doing with it to make it a little more concrete what we're talking about when we talk about a mission. So what pieces of a space mission even exist and why is it challenging to do this? Um, because there have been past projects that have described components of a space mission, but nothing that really unifies them the same way that the unified astronomy thesaurus had been these sort of disparate um, or incomplete resources. And the UAT is a way to bring those things together and it be this community built uh, tool. Um, we want to do the same uh, with Metasat and uh, I guess I thought it would be good to give an example. So Missions have, uh, you know, the, the space-based aspects. So there are actual spacecraft and uh, everything that goes along with the operation and decommissioning even of those satellites uh, after they've been planned and successfully launched. Um, but there's also this ground-based component too. So there's all of the work that goes into creating 
the, um, the spacecraft itself, the work of getting it up into space, into orbit, wherever it is going. And then there's also all of the work needed to communicate on a continuous basis with that spacecraft. So you have multiple pieces involving multiple parties with a lot of complexity and a lot of different resources um, kind of implicated in all of those components. And so distant teams, teams that are collaborating um, across, the, across the planet uh, have trouble sometimes communicating about this, even if they're um, something as sophisticated as a, as a NASA mission. So uh, my example here is actually from 1998, a mission referred to as the Mars Climate Orbiter. Um, so to make it clear how, how difficult the little details are sometimes when you can't quite communicate well. Um, and when your metadata isn't machine actionable in this context. Um, but the Mars Climate Orbiter was a NASA satellite that was launched in 1998. And uh, it did all of the work of getting it up into space and approaching Mars. But one of the really big challenges once you get something to Mars is actually to get it into orbit around Mars. And because of a miscommunication between the software on Earth that was trying to communicate with the satellite and the satellite itself and the software that it was using, the, uh, the spacecraft actually crashed into the planet. So we had this issue where Imperial units were being used by the software on Earth to uh, measure propulsion. So it was transmitting in uh, pounds of force per second, whereas the software uh, so the software on Earth was using imperial units and the software on the spacecraft was using metric units. And so this miscommunication just in something as simple and as trivial as what kind of units are being used by the software uh, transmitted by the spacecraft actually caused this catastrophic event. Um, so sometimes the devil really is in the details. And if your metadata isn't transparent and there's no agreement across systems about what's going on, um, you can really have kind of a bad time. So um, I guess next slide, please. And so if we want to prevent catastrophes and we want to be able to learn from uh, past missions, ongoing missions, missions that we're just not even a part of at all, but that we might want to refer to for who knows why in the future, you need, you need good metadata and you need to be able to um, have that metadata be open. Um, but where do we start with all of this? Because um, a space mission is complicated. Like I said, a big space mission like the NCO is even more complicated. So where do we go to kind of scope what we're trying to do effectively so that we can build? And what we decided to do is to start with small sats. So um, a small sat uh, is a small satellite and um, that's kind of relative, it's quite a range. So that's anything under uh, 500 kilograms. So that can actually be quite large, um, but it's not, it's not infinitely large. So something like Sputnik uh, 1, uh, that would be considered a small sat today, but many small sats are things like CubeSats or FemtoSats, which are, um, you know, yay big and uh, something like a femtosat actually could fit in the palm of your hand and we have picosats there's just an entire world of very small instrumentation that can be launched into space something like hubble which is um, much larger is not considered a small sat um, but we think that what we've built um, what we're doing with small sats will translate well to these larger space missions provided we're able to start with use cases that are extensible um, so you'll see uh, just for that kind of a size, science, a size reference point, um, a movie model of Sputnik 1. So this would be something that's considered small today. Uh, Daniel, next slide, please. Um, and a little more on why small sets. So in addition to being something that is um, small, like these missions are themselves uh, reliant on many fewer components, like you only have so much you can fit in a small satellite. Um, they're also increasingly important to astronomers and engineers. So our community at the CFA has its own small sat uh, initiative going on where our scientists are trying to leverage uh, small satellites as a platform to do their research more. And this isn't just our community and it's not just NASA too, but I have a quote here from NASA, um, basically stating that 
uh, small spacecraft because of their ability to re reduce costs in new space missions. It's a lot cheaper to fly something as small as your as that can fit in the palm of your hand than something like Hubble. Um, that they're enabling and expanding uh, more access to space, and that they have um, the capacity to help facilitate entirely new architectures for a wide range of activities in space with potential for exponential jumps in transformative science. So these uh, platforms, although they're small, they are very important to the future of um, astronomical research and spaceflight engineering more broadly. So focusing in on small sets seemed like the way to go. So next slide, please. And um, to kind of drive home, I guess, the impact that we think we can have with Metasat, um, I know I brought up MCO as a mission that was a catastrophic failure, um, quote unquote. There was a lot learned from that. I don't want to under understate that. It wasn't completely a loss for, for sure. Um, but uh, CubeSats and small sets, so CubeSats are a type of small sat, uh, they have actually got a surprisingly high failure rate. And one of the things that contributes to those failures is the fact that lots of these missions are being um, uh, run by quote hobbyists. So that would include schools, universities, um, places where people are just starting to prototype new instrumentation, where they're doing their first uh, research missions. And they have about a one in three failure rate, um, actually. When you look at the quote industrialists, um, people like NASA and SpaceX, you have a much lower uh, reported failure rate, but we still have a very high. Um, proportion of satellites that are, quote, dead on arrival. So about 20% of these small CubeSat missions um, are never able to actually communicate with Earth. So they got all the way up and we never were able to actually establish uh, that link to actually learn from what they were doing. And so I should point out that that doesn't include um, things like these constellations. So constellations of small sets that are all sort of working together on a single mission. Uh, so these numbers don't include those, but case in, long story short, the failure rate is really high. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so what do we do about that? Um, knowing that thousands of these small satellites are being launched every year, and we want to be able to learn from others who have had those failures, well, how do we do that if finding detailed information about them is really challenging? Uh, right now, or at least until metasets come about, there's no real mechanism in place to help search across platforms or to really connect up all of the pieces of a mission so that you can really start learning from past missions and ongo and finding out more about ongoing missions. And so that could be something as simple as who else used this sensor? Um, what, where are the papers associated with that mission? Uh, who, who uh, when, when was the launch? Did, what was the orbit that that satellite established? These are sort of baseline questions at a high level about a given mission that are right now really challenging to answer. And so we hope Metasat is a tool that will help us get past um, this bottleneck. So, and next slide. And I think, Daniel, this is where I hand it off to you. Sure. Um, thanks, Dana. Yeah, so um, we started off, like Dana mentioned, with larger, like, envisioning using uh, Metasat to describe large space missions. And since we decided to uh, work with small satellites, um, things got a bit easier. And as far as the different, uh, the data, the software and the hardware involved with, with those missions. And so what Metasat uh, does is we've created a vocabulary that can be used to describe all three of those parts of a small satellite mission in a way that is both human and machine actionable. So on our website, which is uh, schema.space, um, if you go forward slash metasat, you'll find yourself at our um, the main browsing page for our vocabulary. And so here uh, we have decided to break down um, each mission into different segments and families. So even though the small satellite mission is a lot simpler than the traditional large enterprise class mission, um, there's still an extreme level of complexity to them. So 
Uh, at the highest level, we've broken down the lexicon into what we were calling mission segments. And so uh, they are uh, space, ground, launch, and user. So the space segment includes the spacecraft itself, all of its components, um, most major subsystems that are universal from mission to mission. So that includes electrical power systems, uh, thermal control systems, propulsion systems, things like that, including the onboard computer. So just general metadata for computing parts. Um, it also includes uh, things like orbital parameters, orbital determination. So things like apogee, perigee, uh, different, different uh, data points that can be used to uh, pinpoint a location of a spacecraft. Um, we also have a ground segment, which uh, includes a, uh, a ground station terminal, which is used to communicate with the spacecraft. Um, that also, uh, that segment also includes our ground station uh, network portion. And so we are currently uh, piloting Metasat terms on the SatNogs um, ground station network, which is operated by the Libra Space Foundation. And so they use uh, Metasat terms to uh, organize all the metadata associated with the ground stations that are a part of that network. So that includes things ranging from bibliographic information on the ground station uh, operators. Uh, it also includes uh, telemetry metadata, uh, things that are used to describe the physical components of ground stations like antennas, um, in addition to frequency bands and stuff like that. So that's the ground segment. The user segment is kind of an experimental segment that we're, that we're, we're, uh, we're still not sure which direction it will take, but it is, you can almost look at it as a subsection of the ground segment where it includes metadata that's involved with everything to do with what, how a user interacts with a spacecraft. So this is, so for example, it would include metadata on, let's say like a GPS transceiver in your car, or it also would include things that might be involved with um, GIS systems or um, uh, even satellite radio, TV, um, mobile communication networks, stuff like that. So this, is very, this, this experimental segment is just getting started, but um, you know, I'm excited to see where it will go. But then the, the fourth segment that we have is uh, the launch segment, which covers the launch vehicles. Uh, so things like rockets, um, there's a lot of overlap there with our propulsion system as part of the space segment, but it's very rocket focused. And it also includes um, uh, metadata to describe launch service providers. So um, companies like SpaceX or Rocket Labs or um, you know different different companies like that we could use that segment to describe. So and then the families are part of all those are like a different subcategory of all those segments. And so for example in the space segment under the spacecraft a family we have a dedicated family for thermal control. Um, and so that's just a more granular look at the vocabulary. So what makes the vocabulary special and what, what makes it um, machine readable is that each con so we call it our terms concepts and for each concept uh, we have an accompanying uh, uni uniform resource identifier or a uri and uris most people are familiar with urls which are a type of uris but uris are a specific identifier used to locate a resource and so in our vocabulary our uri which takes the form of a url so it's schema.space slash metasat Slash, so for example, gravity, uh, this resolves to a page that we have on, um, on, on gravity. So it, we included in that page, we have a description of it, so which we have sourced. So in this way, Metasat is a bit of a dictionary. We have an example value just for, uh, just for the user's uh, convenience. We, and then we have synonyms, which is um, one of the most important parts of vocabulary. So one issue such as with the, similar to the issues that are uh, faced by the Mars uh, Climate Orbiter is that sometimes different space agencies or even different, um, uh, different databases involved with a single mission have different terms that are synonymous but that are used to represent the same data. So for example, sometimes gravity is mentioned as gravitation, or sometimes it's more specific and it's referred to as a gravitational force. 
where in multiple databases, these are all referring to the exact same value. And so what Metasa does in our synonym portion of the vocabulary is that we try to remove that ambiguity. Um, and so that is a big part of what we're trying to do with Metasat. And then also you can see at the bottom here, we have concept segments and we have concept families. Um, so those are examples of what I was talking about um, earlier. Uh, the next big part of the vocabulary is that each individual concept is also what we call crosswalked to another resource. And so crosswalking is uh, pretty much, so we'll have let's say there's a definition by Encyclopedia Britannica on gravity, um, we map it to our definition of, uh, of gravity, to our individual URI for that concept of gravity. And so this is a way of bridging existing resources such that neither needs to change um, their identifier for a concept or what language it's in. So for example, if you're if your concept is in French, um, we can crosswalk to it such that if you use your French term in your database, um, it resolves via our URI to our database, in, which is in English. Um, and so it's a great way of also reducing ambiguity between, uh, between language. And so um, relevant to uh, Australia, we have already crosswalked to the Australian education vocabulary. Um, and we also have crosswalked to the Unified Astronomy Thesaurus, and also the, oh, here, here's Australian education vocabulary for gravity. So you can see that they have a URI for it here. And so we have crosswalked to it, um, to our concept, but we have also crosswalked to, uh, almost like I'm missing some slides here. I'll just talk about it. So we're, we're, we also crosswalked to Wikidata. So Wikidata is a massive, it must be the largest, um, knowledge base of terms uh, on the internet. And it is used by the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, particularly through its project, uh, you know, through Wikipedia, its main project to uh, represent all the concepts that are in their, um, uh, in their knowledge base. So for example, if you go to a Wikipedia page on gravity, there will be an accompanying Wikidata uh, identifier for that concept of gravity. And so, we have crosswalked all of every single one of our terms virtually unless it's a brand new term that we've created to Wikidata. and so this has been one of our um one of our biggest projects and uh, the fact that we've done that has helped a lot with things like uh using metasat to bring up data that's googled that's used like in google search so google search utilizes Wikidata a lot and so if you were to google uh let's say gravity, um, it would pull up the, probably your first result would be the Wikipedia page on gravity, which would also resolve to Wikidata, which would also resolve to Metasat. And so um, that's something that we are uh, pretty proud of that we've done. And also Wikidata has um, many translations into different languages. Um, and uh, so that's another perk of crosswalking to them. So um, now on this slide, so we uh, we already have some existing uh, project partners. So I already mentioned um, uh, the Libre Space Foundation. So we are currently being piloted on the SatDogs ground station network. Um, and so that has been, um, been fantastic. We are also working with NASA's Small Satellite Virtual Institute, so S3VI. Uh, they have a bunch of things going. So their, their big one is their, um, their, their spoon database, which is uh, small parts on orbit now. And so that is a, uh, a database used by, um, by, the, uh, by vendors of small satellite parts. Um, and so we are trying to use Metasat terms to, to create an agreement um, between different vendors on those, uh, on those parts, on those components. And then lastly, um, also involved with NASA, but there's other private uh, companies involved with this too, is the Small Satellite Reliability Initiative. Uh, they have recently put out a knowledge base which addresses that problem that Dana had brought up earlier on the lack of um, any sort of uh, warehouse for like lessons learned documentation. And so uh, they are addressing that problem. And so hopefully we will be able to use Metasat to inform their glossary of terms. And uh, so when you're searching for 
lessons learned uh, documents on a particular mission, you could use Metasite terminology to find your results. Um, so our big next step and one thing that I thought was important to bring up during this presentation is that we are we have decided to create what we're calling the Metasat Steering Committee. So since Metasat is an open, uh, open, openly collaborative, uh, open and collaboratively driven uh, project where it's entirely feedback uh, based. So none of us as we are librarians are experts or space engineers um, in the area, any sort of area of aerospace engineering is not something that we're familiar with. So our whole project has been community driven and that has been um, extremely fruitful so uh, we we have a lot of voices involved and we want to make uh, a system and, and we want to put a system in place where all those different voices can steer the development of metaset into the into the future and so this would be an advisory body for uh, metasat's governance um, and consist of a group of you know a dozen or so uh, different partners uh, both whether they're government, university, uh, private sector, that would um, all contribute to um, to uh, the development of the Metasat um, vocabulary and toolkit. And so we envision NASA to be part of that. We would love the Australian Space Agency, who I am in con contact with, uh, to be a part of that. Um, all sorts of open source um, uh, organizations and uh, as individuals so we'll we'll see where um, this goes but we are roughly basing it off of the UATs the um, steering committee model and so um, that could be a point of reference if you're interested in learning more about what we're trying to do and so this brings me to this one of the final slides so the, for the future of Metasat um, so I mentioned the new government structure and we also have re revised our release uh, cycle. So versioning of this vocabulary is quite tricky. And so uh, if you go to our GitLab repository, which is um, you could find on our website, through our website, um, you can see that we have a release cycle fleshed out, but that might be something that will change with the, um, the incorporation of a new steering committee. So some of the slides that weren't working before were about uh, this data format that we use called JSON LD. Uh, to, that is used to organize our URIs. So JSON-LD is a variant of regular JSON uh, for, for linked data. And so what it is, is it's a, um, it's, it's a very lightweight uh, data format that could be used to organize all of your uh, URIs in one place such that you could use that to create a metadata schema, which could then be used to say, organize a database or to, um, to be it could be used to let's say organize all the uris that are used in an api um, and so we like json ld because it's lightweight it's flexible it's also human readable which um, you can see if you go to our gitlab repository we have a bunch of examples of using metasat uris in json ld um, uh, format but it's also great because um, it has this feature called the context feature and context feature what that means is we could link, um, we could incorporate different vocabularies directly in the document and uh, pretty much create a key for each of those doc, each of those vocabularies and then refer to those vocabularies within the document um, itself. And so we have a lot of resources on the website if you wanna look into this more. Um, and it's just one of many different ways that you could use the Metasat vocabulary and its URIs. Um, the other way is, you know, right now the most popular method of say organizing a database is through using the resource description framework rdf and so we would really like to be able to create um, many more rdf files for um, each individual metasat concept that's something that we don't have yet and so we would love to do that like the uit and in order to accomplish that we need to change how we store our uris which right now is just in a regular database and um the the thing about the rdf serializations too the rdf is that we could serialize it into different formats so we envision it being an rdf xml rdf turtle uh n triples and, and different things like that that could be used for a variety of applications things that we're not even i'm sure aware of and then the last few things that metasite is looking to do in the future is we'd like to create our own api um, that could be used 
um, that will just include all the meta set terms. And so people could use that in order to, let's say, create their own crosswalks or um, all sorts of semantic web applications could be used um, via uh, a meta set API. Uh, we also are looking for further adoption integrations. Like I mentioned, the Australian Space Agency is a new partner that we're interested in uh, collaborating with um, open source communities. We're looking at the AMSAT, uh, a bunch of different other groups and universities, especially University of Colorado Boulder. Um, and uh, so we're, we're, we're interested in seeing what they can provide through feedback, but also through integration of Menaset into their own systems. Uh, we're also interested in uh, using Menaset terms for search engine optimization, so SEO. So if anyone's familiar with web development, um, a lot of times these JSON-LD files are used in, are embedded within header files, uh, or within the header of an HTML document um, that is used for um, Google's search algorithm. So kind of what I was talking about before, Google's knowledge graph. Um, so if you use Metaset terms in your JSON-LD file of the header of your HTML page, um, you could actually benefit uh, greatly by um, indexing higher in Google's uh, Google search. So there is a commercial side of it as well. Um, and then the last thing, as I said before, also with further adoption integration is that, you know, we're a com community driven uh, project. And so um, in the future, we'd like to see, um, you know, where different voices will take us. And, um, and that that's, that's pretty much pretty much it for me. So if you have any questions, I think we could uh, get into that now. Let's see if there's some comments in the chat. Thanks very much, Daniel and Dana. And uh, we certainly do have some time for comment and discussion. The first, I can see there was a question came up in the chat from Ming asking about uh, whether the crosswork, crosswalks to other vocabularies were done manually and automatically. Dana commented that initially they'd been done manually, but uh, sounded like they're wanting to facilitate crosswalking via an API. Ming or Dana, is there anything else you'd like to ask about or comment on in relation to that topic? I can at least uh, clarify that um, one of the things that we prioritized was crosswalking. So the crosswalks themselves are sort of part of the Metasat toolkit, so to speak, because those were developed manually and painstakingly. Um, so primarily led by Daniel and supported by a few of our other um, st uh, staff assistants in the library um, with lots of consulting from um, the community as well. So those were manually developed, but the goal is to kind of make the use of those things much more flexible via an API. Um, and also those crosswalks are going to continue to evolve and we're open to crosswalking um, to other resources too. Um, but what we wanted to do with Metasat wasn't to just kind of create another quote unquote standard that we wanted everyone to switch over to, so to speak. Um, so we wanted to kind of acknowledge the reality that everyone's not gonna use the same jargon, even if we wanted them to. Um, and that uh, the implementation we created in JSON-LD, um, which unfortunately the slide didn't load, uh, kind of makes it so you can use the quote at context section to use multiple vocabularies. So if you wanted to use the UAT and Metasat and say schema.org or something like that, you could. So I think the crosswalks right now, they were created manually, but we have a lot of aspirations for what we'll do next with them. Ming, do you have any follow-up comments or thoughts in relation to uh, what Dana was elaborating on? No, I think the um, answer is pretty clear. So. <laughs> Uh, okay. No further on that question. So I ask the next question because I was browsing the GitHub and the um, the website. I wondered where, you know, for community to raise user cases or propose terms. But I think now I find it now. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So that, I, I that find would that, be. Yeah. Okay right there on the, on the last link on the slide to so our gitlab.com yeah. that would be 
the spot. There we go. Yep, issue. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> yep. Thanks. Are there other comments or questions? For oh, I Dana just wanted to Daniel? make. Sorry, I just wanted to make one more no, point about ahead. where you can uh, actually make suggestions. Uh, can I actually share my screen, Daniel? Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. Just so you see, I pulled up just randomly selected one of our URIs. So this is for binary, a fine error sensor. And you'll see down at the bottom, there's actually a suggest and edit button. So one of the really great things is that even if you don't necessarily go to our um, GitLab and see like our contributing file or anything like that, uh, we are trying to encourage people to um, help us help us make the vocabulary evolve. So they also just want to point out this button. Yeah, that's good. That's uh, probably um, accessible more widely <laughs> beyond the like GitHub. Are there other comments or questions for Daniel or Dana? While people are thinking, one something that came to mind, Daniel, you mentioned that um, it's tricky to version this resource. And can you say a little about some of the challenges that you're facing and the approaches that you may be uh, considering? Yeah, absolutely. So um, with the vocabulary as large as Metaset, um, there are a lot of minor changes that need to be made. There are things that you know I catch all the time. Uh, so, for example, um, uh, let's say um, there is a incorrect uh, example value um, in the database. So, how do we go about uh, adding that to fixing that change and then creating a new version for Metasat that reflects that change? And so we've adopted semantic versioning, which um, there is a there's certain system of, of uh, kind of doing these batch updates where we could um, include all the minor updates in addition to the larger ones. So that includes uh, adding and deprecating concepts. Um, that's a larger update, a bigger one. Um, and there's also, um, you know, like I said, smaller updates on, on the more of the minor attributes of, of each concept. Um, and so we, we're trying to be as transparent as possible with the updates. And so all of them are documented and recorded as issues in our GitLab repository. Uh, we also, for each version, we mint um, a DOI for it um, and we archive it. Um, and so um, you could keep track of that. Um, in our repository, but also um, on Zenodo. Um, so that's another thing that we do. Um, but yeah, we're, we're still looking to improve um, our release cycle, like I mentioned, hopefully um, with some, some more voices in the steering committee and, and, and better uh, guidance, um, we, can, we can improve it. Yeah, I think one of the, just to kind of build on that, is one of the things that's been wonderful with the UAT is that with the steering committee, it's been, um, Katie's been able to work with um, a lot of different stakeholders to determine kind of a reasonable cadence for updates and um, kind of an agreed upon sense of what constitutes major and minor changes and um, what the expectations would be for a communication about those changes and um, the like. And so I think that we're still uh, kind of getting there. Uh, in terms of how how it, how sophisticated is our decision making process about uh, those releases, opposed to there being uh, kind of challenges in the mechanics. I think the mechanics of it involve updating a database and archiving past releases and communicating about what's in those changes, which is just its own pile of work that we don't necessarily want to be done uh, more frequently than is valuable. If that makes sense. Well, certainly the approach that you're seeking to take to be in tune with the community, with the users, to understand the, the things that will be of importance to them, that sounds like a really good approach to take in it, to help consider you know, what is or isn't worth uh, doing. 
Yeah, I think another thing too, just to sort of build on that, is depending on the different stakeholders, I guess what it would mean to implement a new version may, may be more or less challenging, um, depending on the platform and how they're making use of, um, of the technology. So I think if we were to have a, as we move forward, having more people wanting to and actually moving forward with implementations and different approaches to using the tool, that'll really kind of inform the cadence and everything else around what we want to do. Any other comments or questions for Dana or Daniel? Or otherwise, Dana and Daniel, are there any other uh, points you'd like to make or issues you may wish to reiterate or draw out further from the discussion today? I think I might just want to say one other thing about our use cases that we didn't really touch on in the presentation. Um, and this is kind of be building on, I guess, what we've seen with the UAT. The first implementations of the UAT have been by in the publishing landscape. So UAT is being used, like I said, by the AAS to tag journal articles, publications. It's also being used um, internally for um, uh, some systems around telescope time proposals for, for things like Hubble. Um, so ideally, you would be able to say like, okay, well, you proposed to do work in this area. So you had this subject in mind for your observation. What did you actually publish on um, is like a line that can be drawn when you have those two kinds of implementations. Um, but we had not initially been thinking of reaching out as much to publishers when we started working on Metasat because we were focused more on our engineering teams that we're working with. And increasingly, it became apparent from there, um, the opportunities with different types of platform developers. So people are developing things like this knowledge base um, that Daniel alluded to and the Australian Space Agency and their forthcoming website is really kind of part of the conversation that we're having with them now. Um, but we are planning to kind of circle back more and think about um, publishers in this context and how they might be able to take advantage of Metasat and the UAT. Um, and uh, kind of along similar lines, uh, where there's opportunity for us to incorporate Metasat, there may be opportunities to bring the UAT into that discussion as well, provided that what the instrumentation they're building is being used for astronomy, uh, it might behoove them to take advantage of the thesaurus we have for describing astronomy. So these things are kind of two sides of the same coin. Okay, well, looking in the chat, I don't see any additional questions or comments. So we're approaching uh, the hour. Last chance for any final questions or comments to uh, Dana and Daniel. If not, well, look, thanks, thanks so much, uh, Diana and Daniel, for coming along to uh, discuss Metadata today's session. It's a, a wonderful initiative and really useful to hear about all of the activity and uh, development work that's uh, going on. A reminder to everyone that this session will be, well, is being recorded. It'll go up on the ARDC YouTube site and we'll send out a reminder to everyone who registered so that they'll be able to uh, see the recording. And thanks also to everyone who came along today and participated. And with that, we'll draw the session to a close. Thanks again. Bye all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.